I started um, thinking about the importance of the role of extracellular matrix. These are the very large molecules um, that are outside the cells, and um, in those days, people believed that they only uh, are scaffolds, and they keep shape, but they don't do anything else, and uh, uh, that basically everything was determined that once you started developing, the tissues and organs got developed in a deterministic way. In other words, once a nose, always a nose, once an eye, always an eye, and I very quickly realized that that couldn't be so because all the genes in your body are all the same, and yet you have this huge number of organs that do very different things. So I began to question this concept of a single oncogene actually being able to make tumors. And this was in the heyday of excitement about oncogenes. And so I came from a background of bacterial genetics and chemistry, and so I didn't read the textbooks to know that I'm not supposed to be saying this. I just looked at the data, and the data were indicating that we could take Rouse sarcoma virus, which is a very, very potent oncogene, and we can put it in a chicken embryo, it's a chicken virus, and in a chicken embryo, and it wouldn't give rise to tumors, and yet in the chickens it would do it. And if we took the embryos and chopped them up and put enzymes on them and isolated the cells and put them in a dish, they got mass transformed. That means they became malignant. So it was quite clear that the context in which a cell existed determines what that cell can do. So we went on, and because people were unwilling to listen about chickens, or metabolism, I chose the mammary gland to show that the mammary gland, in fact, responds to hormones, to growth factors, but also to extracellular matrix. And we showed that if you take cells that make milk in the mouse and you put them in a dish, even if you give them all the hormones, they forget to make milk. So we showed that extracellular matrix specifically an important extracellular matrix called laminin-1 is crucial in tissue specificity. So we made a model in three dimension because nothing about you is two-dimensional. So we made a three-dimensional model where we could put the cells in a laminin-rich gel, and lo and behold, they got reorganized, they looked like a breast, and they made tons of milk. So we have gone on and shown the mechanism by which extracellular matrix signals. We have shown how it does it. We have shown how the extracellular matrix talks to chromatin and nucleus. And we have done a whole lot of other things. The important thing about those papers is that we use this assay of three-dimensionality to have the method of distinguishing a normal cell and a cancer cell from the breast. And there is no way you can do that the usual way. When you put them in a dish, and which is flat, and you look at them, they look the same, more or less. So when you put them in three dimension, the malignant cells make a very ugly tumor. And the non-malignant cells reorganize, and they make this beautiful three-dimensional structure with very, organ we call them an asinus, and they are very polar. They have a beautiful basement membrane, a secretory activity, very organized nuclei. Now, if you dissociate these cells and put them in a dish, they lose it again. So it is quite clear that even in breast, and for that matter, every tissue of your body, the context is important. So one of the things I was talking this morning was that there is wisdom in your nose. There is wisdom in your prostate. There is wisdom in your eye. There are reasons they look the way they do. They have a functional significance, right? So w what we have done is we have used this three-dimensional separation of normal and malignant cells, and we had asked if the context is important, could we take a really, really malignant cell and do something with it to regain the structure? And would the cell think now they are normal? Would they do it, even though the genome is malignant? And we did it. So we found ways of what we call tumor reversion. 
to revert the tumors to a very pretty organized thing. We slowed down signaling through the membrane, and they could actually form these three-dimensional structures. And if we inject those into the mouse, we don't get tumors. Even, and then when we analyze the genome, the genome is the same as the disorganized tumor one. So it's clearly the architecture and the context, again, are very important. And as we revert these cells, we find that signaling pathways that are important in cancer and are the target of drugs behave differently in three dimension and in two dimension. So if you want to do drug testing, you have to do it in three dimension. Otherwise, you're going to get very funny answers. Now, one of these papers, which has gone to cancer research, has to do with the fact that even interaction between a tumor cell and endothelial cells, which form the angiogenic vessels, are dependent on tissue structure. So if we put the endothelial cells on top, human endothelial cells on top of a filter, and we put tumor cells on the bottom, if they are disorganized, the endothelial cells migrate and come down because the tumor cells make VEGF, and VEGF attracts the endothelial cells. Now, if we organize the tumor cells and make them polar the way I described it, all of a sudden they think they are normal and they don't migrate. So it's a very exciting finding, and it also has to do with how we do these reversions and how these different pathways talk to each other and how we could find actually candidate molecules for therapy. So when the cells are organized, the gene they express are good genes. So if patients have those genes, their, pro their prognosis is good. When the cells are disorganized, then the prognosis is not good. I think it's very important to do these things in conjunction with pathologists, and it's very important to use cell and molecular biology together with this three-dimensional structure. More and more people realize that tumors are very, very heterogeneous, that within a given tumor, for example, breast cancer is not the same as lung cancer, so breast and lung cancer are also tissue-specific. So there is a reason they don't do the same thing. A given so-called oncogene does one thing in lung and does something slightly different in breast. The patients that have BRCA1 mutation only get breast cancer. The people who have APC mutation, they get only colon cancer. So we have to go, and even within breast cancer, there are different kinds of breast cancer. Some are very malignant, some are, have good prognosis, and people are going toward doing individual patient analysis. And the individual patient analysis or 3D assay, or this way of thinking, are going to be extremely useful because you know what's on the surface membrane and you can do your drug target.